we're going to do um, now verse two, which of course is one of the classic um, easily misunderstood, um, totally profound once you get it. Um, before we do that, did you guys want to clear any, clarify anything about um, self-cherishing itself? Are you clear on the, the premise and kind of the parameters of it and how it's different to self-grasping? Okay, so we're still in the mission of overcoming self-cherishing. Of course, self-grasping is an issue, and we're going to get to that, but self-cherishing is our main project today. And um, so we're going to look at verse two, which is um, very cool. All right. So verse two is, when in the company of others, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all, and from the depths of my heart, hold others dear and supreme. All right, so you're looking at that, and lots of you have had this teaching before. So what are the common pitfalls or mistakes when reading this verse? What are things that people think it means, but it definitely doesn't mean? Yeah? <laughs> common misconceptions about this verse. I know that you guys know. I know you. <laughs> out with it it's not meant to be in any way a put down of yourself amen amen <clears throat> exactly exactly and the key feature here is when in the company of others okay so when you're with other people what's the point of seeing yourself as the lowest of all what's the benefit of that why would you do that? Um, because you put yourself in the attitude that everybody has something to teach you. Um, exactly. Every single person has something to teach you. Exactly. Exactly. It immediately positions you into receptivity. You're immediately in receptivity or student mode or beginner's mode. You know, that classic um, Zen quote, I think Suzuki Roshi, Zen mind, beginner's mind, you know, in the mind of the expert, there are a few possibilities, right? That idea is a very important psychology for us because we're not thinking we don't know anything or we're not good. We're thinking open, yeah, listening, like really deep listening. And it is just as Joanne says, it's, it's that every, everyone has something they can offer us. Everyone has a unique perspective they can offer us. And you're really being genuine about the truth of that. It's, it's a way of really honoring everyone's Buddha nature, but also really honoring everyone's history and unique perspective and context. Because even if they are less educated, maybe they're less intelligent, maybe they're less worldly, maybe they're all these kind of like surface less things, still there's a unique perspective there that you haven't experienced. And what's the point in going over your own knowledge again and again and kind of proving all the time what you know? You know, what's like you already know, why do you need to say it? You know, more interesting to learn something. So there's that level. But there's another level, which is like the leader servant. Yeah, the leader servant position, which is a position of very strong dignity together with humility. Right? It's like a dignified humility. It's a confident modesty. Can you kind of touch what I'm saying where you're like not at all looking down on yourself? You have incredible dignity and incredible confidence, but also just this expansive listening mind that really is curious about what other people have to say and doesn't have to be first or top. And if you don't have to be first or top, people are safe with you, right? People feel really safe with you if there is no competition. Yeah. So if you just remove yourself from a competitive atmosphere or a competitive idea, it's like everything relaxes a little bit. Do you know that feeling, right? Like 
we can get competitive about anything. We can get competitive about suffering. We can get competitive about, I don't know, mistakes. Who's the worst one? Who's the stupidest one? You know, we can be competitive even about low things. But what if you're not the most of anything? And you just kind of relax. I mean, it's just such a nice atmosphere to be around, isn't it? When you're with someone who's not in competition, then your own need to prove also releases. I think, you know, it's good to think about like, how is his holiness when he's in one of those panel discussions with fancy neuroscientists and physicists and advanced psychologists. And he's with all of these people who are at the top of their field. We know as Buddhists that all of the things that they're trying to prove, Buddhism already has proved, right? We already know his holiness knows all of those things. But in the moment, in the panel, what is he like? Like, he's so just curious. And when they say something, something that is probably totally obvious to him, and there's deeper versions of it that are obvious to him, he doesn't have to prove that or say that or show off. He just says, wonderful. Right? It's just so empowering, right? And it's just so respectful and so kind. And because of that, these fancy scientists, one by one, kind of get off of their soapbox and get cuter <laughs> as the panel goes by. They become more human, right? Like at the beginning of the panel, they were all like their title <laughs> and their name and their impressive vocabulary. <laughs> and then as time goes by, they all turn into human beings until at the end of the conversation, it's just this like beautiful collaboration of ideas and sharing and connecting. And no one is like winning the panel <laughs> of who's the smartest one, right? So, I mean, so really this one, I think our best example is His Holiness because he really is such a model of how to have dignity and confidence without arrogance and without humiliation. You know, he's the lowest, but he's not low. Can you sort of feel it, right? Or, um, you know, the way Lama Zopa Rinpoche is with like tiny animals. You know, um, if you've ever seen him walking and he'll stop and like wait for an ant to like finish crossing the road. It's just such a, it's just, it's so beautiful. I can't even describe it, but it's this like deep respect you know, it's like, he's the big llama. He's got places to go and people to see, but he doesn't identify that way. He's like, why is my need to walk from here to there any more important than this little ant's job right now? You know, it's amazing. And what does that do? What it does is it makes everyone feel safe and relaxed and kind of enthusiastic to share themselves because they don't feel like they're gonna be judged and they don't feel like they're gonna be looked down on. So this attitude of, that you could bring or that you could offer to a group of people of being the lowest of all, it just immediately softens the edges. It just immediately makes things feel more comfortable. So when you look at this verse, what does it bring up for you? What does it evoke or what challenges does it present? What? Yeah. In the sense that, you know, as human beings, we kind of want to feel known, you know? Um, I suppose if you've been if being introduced to someone and they start bragging and you consciously don't you know, try and match them, yeah, and then you part, they actually don't know you. And so you have to feel comfortable and, you know, yeah, comfortable enough to allow that to happen without having staked your claim or anything, you know. But So that's a little bit of a challenge because I find that as a parent sometimes <laughs> you'll meet another parent, they'll say, oh, my kids are doing this and this, and, you know, you just have to sort of bite your tongue and say, that's great. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and that's, so I think, it, yeah, it's yeah. a good point, though, because isn't there part of you that feels like if you celebrate their children, it diminishes yours, which isn't true at all. But there is part of our ego that kind of feels that way. Yeah. Is that part of it? Is that like, if you say how wonderful it is that your children are doing this and this, it somehow diminishes your own children or maybe your kids are doing, yeah, no. No, but I mean, we do have compassion and joy, you know, so we do want to rejoice in the good fortune of others, but it just, by the same token, they don't know any more about you. Mm. if, If that's a priority. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's, it's a good point that you're making. And, and what is it in us that feels like we need to be known and by whom and in what way, you know, like to a stamp of validation of our existence as this set of characteristics, you know, it, it is interesting. And, you know, the whole question of reputation becomes a very interesting conversation in Buddhism, because of course, on one hand, a good reputation is not inherently good or useful. A bad reputation is not inherently bad or not useful. You know, we remember the eight worldly concerns and we remember that being focused on reputation is not a good idea or useful and keeps us locked in samsara and blah, 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 many things. And yet we also know if people don't understand some of our qualities, some of our qualities won't get to be used for the welfare of all sentient beings. You know, that our, I don't know, what we can bring to a group won't be utilized. Yeah. Or um, people will miss out on the best of us. But I think that a very relaxed mind that has this lowest of all thing will kind of make it like people will organically start to turn towards you and look at your qualities as there is space for those qualities to come into use rather than needing to like punch a hole in the conversation and show that you can do something and then maybe are utilized you just kind of sit back and wait you know and when there's space or kind of a feeling of invitation you can put your hand up and say i could do that if you want but it's not from a place of needing to prove you know it's, it's a hard place to relax into because, you know, we don't like the idea that people don't know how smart we are or how, I don't know, well-read, well-achieved, well-educated, well whatever. We don't like the idea that people don't understand us. It's not a comfortable idea. We don't like the idea of people looking down on us. But the thing is, is that putting yourself forward in an arrogant way doesn't really prove anything except arrogance. It doesn't prove the qualities that your arrogance is trying to promote. It just proves that you're arrogant. <laughs> right. And, and I think it's, it's interesting to think of how the llamas deal with an arrogant student. Right. Have you ever seen this? My abbot, um, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering is a master of this, where if someone is very arrogant in class, He just validates them until they shut up. (laughs) He doesn't argue with them. He doesn't put them down. He doesn't show them that they're foolish. And, you know, there's a kind of archetypal young traveling man, usually white and heterosexual, who has got a lot of entitlement, you know, that archetype, right? Bless their cotton socks. We'll keep the light on for them. They'll come to a Dharma center and they will have read Greek philosophy and they will read many of Eastern philosophy and they'll say to the Lama, do you know, actually, <laughs> la la la, whatever. And the Lama will usually go, oh, oh, that's very interesting. You're a very smart person. <laughs> Well, the rest of the class is like, oh, they're so rude. They're so inconsiderate. Don't they know who they're talking to? This llama is a geshi. He's a blah, 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 you know. But the llama themselves, they're not defensive. They have nothing to prove. They don't need to, like, again, give them their CV or show them their credentials. They're just like, oh, you're very smart. <laughs> you know? So this lowest of all positioning can actually be very effective for working with arrogant people. But not if you're in a humiliated stance, not if you're in a martyred stance, not if you're looking down on yourself, but if you just have this core 
confident dignity that says, I don't have to win. I don't have to be on top. The arrogant person is arrogant because of insecurity, right? We all know that it's psychology 101, but in the, in your face, it's hard to remember that because it's a big behavior, right? But if you're in lowest of all, often the arrogant person loses their need to prove, right? And they lose a little bit of that insecurity and they might actually be a little bit more human <laughs> and a little bit less abrasive because they don't feel so judged and they don't feel like they need to punch their way through to prove something. So it's an effective psychology for working with difficult people, but it's a very effective psychology for yourself as an individual to manage pride, both their pride and yours. Yeah, no one gets to win or lose if there's no competition. But yeah, what, I mean, what resistance do you have or kind of challenges can you anticipate if you were to live by this verse? Yeah, yeah, Heather. I, I don't know if it's ar arrogance. I'm actually, I'm quite sure it's arrogance, but, but I, I've spent most of my life sort of constructing these ego identifiers to be impressive, right? I mean, I've intentionally tried to achieve things. And, and so as I've been on this path for the last few years and start to let go of those things, it, if I'm being rigorously honest, it's very scary to me. I feel like there's like, who am I without these things that I can wave around to say who I am? And um, so I want to do that. I mean, it's my goal. I can see the benefits and the worthiness in doing it, but I find it very disorienting and hard to find my feet sometimes and, and like scary, truly that, you know, when it's like, well, what does it matter if nobody's, you know, I mean, that's terrifying to me. It's like, I might just poof disappear. Yeah. And I, yeah. You know, honest, I don't think it's a flattering thing for myself, but it's just how I feel. Yeah. I, I think you're not alone. I, I think that's, that's a huge piece of it and you know and then of course there's like socialization too are we all women here i think we are you know the female socialization of you know kind of take a step back and you know let people talk and be polite can sometimes mean that our good ideas get co-opted or we get run over the top of and all sorts of unhealthy things happen in community dynamics that we don't want to happen and you know it's like we don't really want to fight fire with fire. We don't need to have kind of, I don't know, these toxic ways of combating a toxic culture. It's like, if we have enough confidence that knows, even if everyone hates me, it doesn't mean that I'm worth being hated. Even if no one understands that I'm intelligent, doesn't mean I'm not intelligent. And to kind of like keep coming back to, who is it that feels so challenged? Who is that? And that one <laughs> is not there, you know, because it's just as easy to flare up when you're praised. You know, we often talk in the wisdom category of this object of negation, right? And it's the, the object of negation is the inherently existent self, the self that doesn't exist at all, even conventionally. But get, to get that to appear to your mind, you have to remember being criticized or being praised. It's when the eye flares, yeah, when the facade solidifies, when you believe your own hype, right? It's that one is the one that isn't there at all. So it's delicate because people are all kind of egomaniacs and they're gonna just run over the top of us all the time if we're the lowest of all in the wrong way right? But there, it's a mentality. And I think it's a mentality with a lot of breath and space. You know, it's like, there's not a, that rushing to prove energy, or that needing a light on you energy, there's just kind of a, an ability to sit still and watch things play out. And watch for opportunities to offer collaboration and wisdom. You know, it's watching for windows. 
rather than punching windows in. And then, you know, there's the back of your mind that knows that all good ideas, all bad ideas, all ideas are derivative, right? Everything is derivative. So who has ownership over anything? And if person B takes your idea, who cares if it's a good idea, take it. Like it wasn't really mine either. I'm just the one that said it out loud in this room today, but that doesn't make it mine. You know, everything's derivative. So you're just kind of relaxing into that kind of spacious interconnected feeling. It's, it's an interesting place to be. Um, so, you know, you, you really can do this with yourself where you're looking at the advantages of not being seen. You know, the advantages of being a stealth bodhisattva. Yeah. Less expectations is actually a great relief. In a way, I feel like lowest of all is also expansive. Yeah, the most expansive is all, you know, because it's kind of like I was thinking about what's happening in Israel right now, because I've got lots of friends in Israel and, you know, it's on everyone's mind probably. But I was just thinking if it doesn't even matter which side, if just one side could decide to share and like let go of the storyline then the other side might feel a little bit safer and a little bit more in the mood for collaboration. But it's like, there's just so much, I am the one who has suffered the most energy. You know, it's like, it's competitive suffering. And, you know, from a distance from us not there, we can say, well, both sides have suffered, obviously, and both sides are right and both sides are wrong. And everybody's got weird terrorists on their side and both sides have innocent people. And, you know, guys, just chill, <laughs> you know, from a distance. It's easy to say that, right? Can we just share, you know, from a distance? But when you're right in it, for one person to say, do you know what? I don't have to be right I can just let it go and can we start fresh? Imagine the conversation that could happen. You know, imagine that in your own family, you know, if there's some like big family wound, if someone just let go of their story of being the victim or let go of their story of being wronged, they can still acknowledge harm, but they're not identified with it. You know, so none of this is to say you don't get to acknowledge harm. You should, <laughs> but you're not identified as the one who was harmed because it's that one feeling that keeps you locked in the chaos and all of the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, number three. Number three is uh, less confronting. <laughs> number three is vigilant the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others. I shall confront and avert it without delay. So vigilant is our invitation for introspection. It's our invitation for mindfulness. And vigilant is a very useful word. Um, and kind of think about what the English word evokes for you. To be vigilant is kind of what creates an idea of a medieval guard of a castle, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. A gatekeeper of some kind? Vigilant, right? It's someone who is still, but watching. Yeah, a very awake watcher. And we need this very awake watcher who is just noticing what we're saying to ourselves. There's what you're saying to yourself, and then there's the observer that's going, well, that's a weird thing to say to yourself, or that's not a useful thing to say to yourself, or that's a good thing to say to yourself, but like a watcher that sometimes doesn't have anything to say, but they're just watching. It's, it's a totally different experience with your internal dialogue or your internal monologue if you're watching it or you're not watching it. Because when you're not watching your own internal thoughts, your internal narrative, you believe it. Yeah. And some of it is worth believing. 
you're making a series of observations and a series of opinions based on your observations. And some of those are quite true from a worldly perspective and don't need to be challenged, but some of them are nonsense that you've been saying to yourself your whole life. And if you've got the watcher, then it's kind of like activating your Dharma knowledge that can say, oh, yes, that is something I say to myself, but actually not true. <laughs> you know, and you're not believing everything you think, you know, and you're not creating a whole worldview based on patterns that have never been examined. So there's that piece, right? And the other piece of the verse is the moment a delusion arises. So if you catch it in the moment it arises, it's like what we were talking about before, that the mindfulness itself dispels it like poof, it's gone. You break the spell of the story you tell yourself, if you can catch it in its infancy. When it escalates, it gets harder and harder to confront. Can you feel the difference between like waking up a little bit tired, a little bit grumpy, but then something clicks you into your grounded self. Maybe you say your motivation to yourself, maybe you do your practice, maybe you just brush your teeth and kind of shake off a bad sleep. But you know, you had a mood and then you shifted. As opposed to the days where you wake up a little bit grumpy and you give in. Yeah, and then it kind of takes over and then you start to believe it. And then even if you eventually have mindfulness, wake up and say, oh, you're in a mood today, dude. Whoa, like watch that mood. That's not enough to dispel it. So at least you have objectivity that says, wow, I'm in a bad mood. I better not send any emails today, note to self, <laughs> right? But it's not that awareness is not enough to kind of like dispel it. Yeah, because it's gotten stuck in there. Can you feel the difference like when it's small enough to catch and dispel as opposed to it's gotten a, a foothold and now that's your day and you have to kind of just ride it out and try not to cause any trouble until it passes. It, it's a little bit like an intoxicant, these negative states of mind, right? Like, I don't know if you have a small amount of an intoxicant and then you notice you're getting tipsy, but you get a shock you can kind of sober yourself up or like uh, coffee or something. I don't remember. It's been a long time, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> like a little bit. But then if you're drunk, you're just drunk. Like you have to just write it out. You know, give someone your car keys, like sit on your hands, duct tape your mouth shut, just wait it out. <laughs> yeah, try not to cause any trouble. Moods are like that. So that's why this vigilance is doubly key. Because if you can catch it when it's small, done, moving on, life goes on, recalibrated like that. Yeah. So it's um, an easy to understand verse. Um, it's a hard to practice verse, but I think it's easy to understand. Part of the impetus to catch it is to remember the way in which it endangers myself and others, right? Why be vigilant? Because it endangers myself and others how to be vigilant, do it the moment a delusion appears in my mind, right? Confront and avert it without delay. Yeah, so that one's the, probably the easiest intellectually. Um, yeah, Jan? Oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was listening to a long ago the teaching, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he seemed to be thinking something slightly contradictory. It was in the context of um, negative emotions. Would you say that the, and he was advocating an approach with me, which, which was not to confront and avert, was rather to sit with and, and let things dissipate at their own, you know, according to their own natural history or whatever. Mm. Am, I, um, am I looking at a difference between negative emotions and delusions or am I looking at two different approaches to dissipating or working with or against them? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good point because that is one of the good advices too, is to like watch it and let it roll through. And I think what's happening is it's two strategies that are closer to the same than they seem. It's more like, what is the angle you get at the same strategy intellectually? Because the basic premise is if you watch a negative state of mind with introspection, it kind of can't last because you already have introspection that is imbued with an agenda yeah, of bodhicitta. Yeah, something I've noticed personally. But right? So for some yeah, people having this attitude of... Disappears. Yeah, exactly, right? And so for some people having an idea of like a gatekeeper that's like, what's the password? Oh, that's a delusion. Nope, you can't come in. You know, like, <laughs> a, you know, gatekeeper kind of inner persona is a very useful kind of access point into that mindset. For other people, the idea that if I just watch it, with introspection, with that vigilance, it will die a natural death. And what they're both saying is it needs to be watched. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's not necessarily referring to um, remedies or antidotes. Or they're, yeah, they're both talking about when it's small enough to dispel through the power of mindfulness. Okay. So now, the example that you gave is actually also useful in the heat of the moment as well. Like you missed your window of vigilance and now you're just mad. You know, you're just ropeable. One of the advices is to just let it roll through and just watch it. But that's very kind of advanced practice if you're very well trained. For some people, if you watch your anger, you'll give yourself more reasons to be angry. <laughs> it's like you're powers of analysis will be co-opted by the negative state of mind. And your analysis will say, actually, I was angry about this, but now that I think about it, I'm also angry about this and about this and about this. <laughs> and all of this historical issue and all of the things that reminds me of as well. You know, so it's like, if you're very well trained in this practice, you can also use your example in the height of a negative state of mind, but only if you're really used to it. But that, Otherwise, that depends, yeah, it'll turn. yeah, that depends on you divorcing the fact of the anger from the imagination of the causes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good point, and um, for some people, the idea of a vigilant gatekeeper can make them a bit too uptight. For some people, a vigilant gatekeeper can kind of switch them on and clear the cobwebs and make them a bit focused. So it's also just like for you as an individual, what's the more useful framework? Yeah, so that's another piece too. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. So the next one is um, gonna need a follow-up conversation, I think, but um, we'll start with it at least. Whenever I see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. Okay, so there's a few pieces to zero in on. What is this concept of wicked in nature and overwhelmed by negative actions and suffering? And what is it to hold one dear like you've found a precious treasure? So the wording can be problematic because of course we don't believe that any sentient being is wicked in nature. But, <laughs> but there are people who are either shunned by society historically and so easily written off, or on the other hand, so habituated to negative states of mind, it comes very naturally to them. So it's, it's, you know, His Holiness in one of his commentaries says it can refer to either, either someone who's kind of socially ostracized that generally people don't like and give themselves permission not to like because they're in a category of people that we all decide to have prejudice against. So just the whole concept of them annoys us and we discard them or someone who's genuinely bad behaved and genuinely has a bad motivation and really actively wants to do harm all the time. You know, someone who is just 
used to embezzling money, right? Or you, someone who is just wants to take advantage of the bodies of others and doesn't care about the ripple effect of that. Or somebody who is just a chaos drama queen in any community they come into and relishes in that, right? So people that are that hard are actually rare. Like all of us are hard work sometimes, <laughs> you know? Our partners, our friends, our community will tell us, yes, we are hard work sometimes, but there aren't actually that many people who are really hard work all the time to pretty much anyone they meet. Um, you can think of in your life, when have you had someone that just was a conflict creator, that just almost fed off of it? that relished in it, that wanted to, that didn't care, right? There's not many in your life, right? You got maybe one or two, or you've got like a political figure. <laughs> I don't know if you like live a blessed life that doesn't have hard people in it. You can think of a political figure, but you know, probably at some point, you can also think about when you were a kid, maybe there was a bully who liked being a bully. You know, of course, they they have, you know, suffering and afflictions and all sorts of things to conjure up our compassion. But what you're wanting to do is think about someone who is such hard work, there was no way to avoid the discomfort of being with them, other than to go within. Because they were not going to change anytime soon. Somebody like that is precious. <laughs> Somebody like that is like the best one. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of angles to think about this without, again, like self gaslighting, but to really think, what do I like about myself in terms of qualities? You know, and you just think, okay, what do I actually like about myself? What are some qualities that I think, yeah, I want to keep those, I want to grow those, I want to take them into my next life? One of them might be a type of patience, right? You, your ability to have forbearance with suffering, either physically and mentally, or with people and their behaviors, or both. Whatever our level of patience is, it protects us from getting stressed out when things are hard. Would we have as much patience as we have if we hadn't had hard people? Yeah, it was a trial by fire, right? We weren't just naturally able to be patient out of nowhere. We had to be pushed. And once you've had a really hard nugget in your life, a really tough case, then people who are mildly irritating, you're like, eh, people, <laughs> you know? But, you know, if you didn't have that really hard one, your frame of reference would be different. Your capacity and your resiliency would be different without them. So they were incredibly precious. Thank you for being so obnoxious and harmful. Thank you, that was really useful. Please never do it again, <laughs> right? But you know, thank you, that was really useful. And that is not something that you tell other people to think, right? That is something you only tell yourself to think when you've got the space to do so. Yeah, a lot of these verses are not a good idea to give as advice. <laughs> right? These are all things to tell yourself when you've got the space to hear them. You know, would you say to someone who was molested, this is a precious one? No, that would be so not compassionate. That would be so insensitive. That would be not reading the room. It would be inappropriate. But if you're someone who's been molested and you have enough space from it and safety from it, and you're an adult now, and you've got some resiliency, gently exploring it might be incredibly powerful to see how they were precious. And if that's too much or too soon, don't do it. <laughs> Use someone who was a little less hard. Use the teacher who always made fun of you in class or use the person who cheated on you when you were a teenager. You know, use someone that was hard work, but not the worst one, right? Like you gotta grow into this being something that's useful. Once it is, it's incredibly transformative, but like, this is a delicate one. You know, you would never do this to someone who's fragile. You would never advise this for someone who's right in the midst of processing their trauma, right? It wouldn't be skillful. 
But for someone who's got space from it and safety from it, it's very useful. And, you know, you maybe think of a documentary you've seen about, I don't know, South African victims of war, for example, or, you know, people in Northern Ireland who have lost their whole family. You know, think about people who have really suffered atrocities that were somehow able to forgive the harm doer and even see it as a way that has opened their heart to the universal suffering of humanity and how incredibly inspiring those people are when they've done it genuinely. You know, how powerful that can be to really have taken something horrible as a lesson for transformation, you know? And so if you're kind of like thinking through your life who have been the troublemakers, approach it with a lot of self-compassion and you know that harm doers are still accountable, that harm doers are still responsible and that people still need to be prevented from doing harm. And that is all good common sense that you can keep, right? But internally, what is a way for you to access peace? This is really the challenge of this verse. How do you access peace even amongst all of your worst traumas? You know, a horrible marriage breakdown, the loss of a child, some horrible abuse. These big issues are what's being pointed to here in this verse. And so, you know, again, you can aspire to it if it's too soon. But if you feel ready, sit with it. Yeah. So I'll put it back up and just kind of like have a look. And you see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by negative actions and suffering, right? Those ones. And it's not by accident that this is all one sentence, right? To say wicked in nature is also to say overwhelmed by violent negative actions, meaning habituated to so strongly it's their default. Why? Because of their suffering. Where did their suffering come from? their past negative karma driven by ignorance, right? And so you're able to sort of gently separate the harm doer from what made them into a harm doer. And you realize what made them into a harm doer was the same things that make you into a harm doer. It's just their context was different. And if you'd had their same context, similar behaviors would come from you which is a hard pill to swallow, but something worth sitting with. Thoughts, challenges, insights, that's a hard one. You can always use political figures if it's too delicate to use our personal life, right? If you think of a political figure who, um, whose policies seem really harmful, really self-centered, really, you know, I don't know, there's a politician that was once important in our country recently, <laughs> but, you know, you can think of whoever you like of kind of, wow, they just keep doing the wrong thing. How is that useful to me? How does this one land for you guys? Yeah, yeah, pop in. I guess I'm I'm very blessed to have uh, both political figures and and more than a couple of people in my life that are that are like this. So I have lots of opportunities. Um, I, I get confused at both levels. You know, at at sort of a societal level, it feels like there's it's just not in my nature to kind of check out and distance from it. So I don't know how to always work with it in a way that that's um, I'm learning the lesson, but I'm also being good to myself and taking care of myself. And then, and then on a personal level, the same sort of thing that I can appreciate that this is a teacher, a not so gentle teacher in my life. And yet it's really hard for me to maintain peace. So I, so I need distance. And so I don't know how to kind of work with, you know, how much do I have to actually be in it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And is it, is it something that's healthier to do when you're out of it or um, think of a different time that you're not in 
to kind of help your framework build strength to then bring into the present moment difficult one that can help you know like I can think about, you know, things that happened earlier in my life that were hard and awful and I wish didn't happen that then built some understanding and resiliency and awareness of the human condition. And now with the people in front of me that are hard, part of me knows this is going to be good for me <laughs> because I remember the last time. And that doesn't make me complacent. It makes me peaceful. You know, and part of it is, I think we don't want to give a hard, you know, a terrible person or a wicked person. We don't want to give them credit for being a teacher. They're not planning to be a teacher. They're not thinking, I shall teach you a lesson by my horrible behavior. You know, I mean, maybe the Buddhas are manifesting that way, but I'm guessing they're not that mean. Um, you know, they're not trying to be your teacher. <laughs> they're not trying to be beneficial. And you don't want to kind of give them credit for your own resiliency. You don't want to give them that. They were horrible. They wanted to hurt you. You're not going to say thanks. That's, that's, a, that's what comes up sometimes, right? Another thing that comes up is if I don't have anger, I won't have motivation to change. And that's a habit that we want to break. Yeah, you don't need anger to have passionate action towards positive change. We're just used to needing anger. Yeah, we're used to it. We think we need anger in order to be assertive, in order to stand up for ourselves or to stand up for someone who's vulnerable because we're used to that. But now that we're trying to attempt bodhicitta, we can think I can have even more energy because I don't want them to hurt themselves, let alone anyone else. If they keep doing this horrible thing, they're creating the cause for the very same thing or worse for their future. You know, we don't need another suffering person in this world. There's enough suffering people. We don't want them to do that to themselves. And we also don't want them to spread their mess everywhere. But, you know, it's like both for their sake and for the sake of everyone they might encounter in harm. So you're, you're holding them to important ethical standards, but without a sense of retribution or punishment. You know, you're not complacent. It's just really like, what is the useful thing here to prevent more harm? And then in the back of your mind, you know this is stretching you and this is uncomfortable and this is not what you want, but it is what you want because it's stretching you and it's making you stronger. So titration and pacing is the key to this practice. It is just like physical exercise where you know you need to kind of push a tiny bit. A little bit of discomfort when you're exercising is okay, but not pain. If it's painful, don't do it, right? If it's painful, stop. Like feel the burn and that kind of aggressive, let's just like power through it. That's not what we want, right? But just like a little discomfort is gonna be good for us, is gonna build resiliency and strength. So. That's the pacing or the titration or the kind of framework we want to view it with. And if there's someone in our face in our life right now that is hard like this. It might be a little bit of back and forth between worldly wisdom and Dharma wisdom before you can primarily rely on Dharma wisdom. And I'm sure all of you in Dharma centers have seen folks who probably need some therapy before they go to a Dharma class first, <laughs> right? Because if they jump to Dharma without dealing with their baggage a little bit and getting some basic strategies, they're gonna hear the Dharma the wrong way and it won't work, right? They're gonna hear it through the wrong filter. So, you know, depends on the kind of therapy, right? But some forms of therapy can be so useful for just digesting trauma in a way that it's not actively agitating your mind and, you know, re-traumatizing yourself. Yeah. So, you know, this is advanced practice and it needs to be seen as such, even though intellectually we can get our head around it with just a brief conversation. Experientially, this is just epically advanced. Yeah, so you don't have to be complacent <laughs> is the summary. Don't have to be complacent. In fact, don't be complacent, but um, check your motivation first. Yeah, 
it's the danger, isn't it? Sometimes we're so good at mind training. We're like, oh, well, difficult people. <laughs> and we don't do anything about it at all because we're like too good at mind training. And it's like, oh, well, I'm good enough to not be distressed by it. That means I'm the one that should do something. Right now, it's only distressed people doing something. And they're just, you know, pain is ricocheting off of pain, ricocheting off of pain. And it's just a whole pain storm. Maybe the one that's kind of chill about it should enter into the fray. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, other thoughts about this one? Challenges or insights? Yes, yeah, Sue, unmute. Perfect. Okay, um, I was just thinking about that uh, rather at a practical level than an emotional level. So. For example, we have a prime minister and a government that pays uh, not enough attention to climate change issues. And I think for many of us, after the bushfires and everything else, we know that we can't expect those leaders to solve the problem. So the responsibility is on us to do something. You see what I mean? It, yeah, it's yeah. very different from having, you know, someone like Hitler or a horrible person in your life. But, you know, if um, rather than being angry and sort of, you know, trying to accommodate the difficulties of that leadership or that person, you can actually do something yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think that is the heart of this, too, is that they don't need to change for progress to happen. Whether it's inner progress or outer progress or both, the harm giver, the wicked one, doesn't ever have to change. If they do, that would be fantastic. But that's not what you're banking on, you know? And that is very empowering. That's why mind training can be so uplifting because you no longer need anything to change except your own mentality. And if you start to feel like, right, my government is never going to get their act together because there's too many corporate interests and too much mixed blah, blah, and all of these other, all right, so what can we do in our house, our community, grassroots, do the thing, and, you know, also work on changing the leadership, both, but, you, you know, you can feel more empowered and think, I don't have to wait for badly motivated people to get their act together for things yeah. to change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the heart of it. And, you know, and that can really help us stop hitting our head against the wall, trying to get things to change that have no window of opportunity for change. We start getting more creative and more flexible to go around places and people that have strongly habituated themselves to negativity. That workaround and that flexibility I think that can be an incredibly powerful place to see within ourselves because often we are just kind of like banging on the authority, whatever the authority is. And the authority has a vested interest in maintaining authority, right? And whatever kind of interests are supporting it are self-serving interests. That is the nature of human beings. So how do we get better at collaboration, grassroots, flexibility, you know, kind of pulling the rug under the whole system that needs things to be structured that way, etc. I think that these verses can really help us find that peace of mind for spaciousness to reassert itself. And then from that spaciousness, a different way and a different angle of changing the issues. You know, and at the same time, you're remembering samsara is not fixable. So I'll do my best to fix it and then I'll let go. <laughs> do your best and let go and do your best and let go, you know? And that's our process. Cause if we only let go, that's also not a useful mentality cause it's still very self-cherishing and complacent. But you know that the way in which you help it's limited information you have to work with. It has limited impact because sentient beings and their afflictions. It's this delicate dance, isn't it? Inner work, outer work, inner work, outer work. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the question to ask yourself is, is my inner actions and my outer actions coming from stability and calm? Mm. You know, and what do I need to think and say to myself 
to tap back into the stability and calm that is always accessible there. Underneath the rumble of all my mental weather, how can I keep acting from that place of stability and calm that's less afflicted? Because my solutions will be more stable and more effective. And when they don't work, I won't be so upset. <laughs> you know. Does remembering the fact that badly behaved people are overwhelmed by habit suffering and ignorance help you <laughs> i guess yeah if that background they wouldn't be that way unless they had affliction suffering and ignorance divorced from their ignorance suffering and afflictions they would actually be quite nice <laughs> and make all sorts of good choices yeah joanne and also if they're in your life and they're these you know aggressive negative people You've already done that yourself. Yeah. I know that's the thing that works for me. It may not work for other people, but if I can catch it early, they're there because I've done it already. I've invited them in. It's the, it's the dance around and around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm. Somebody's just got to stop dancing. Mm. And that's the thing that takes all the aggression out of my looking at the situation you know yeah. I can even go as far as to say you know I'm really really sorry to the people I did that to when I was doing it yeah and it, yeah it is quite a dampener on my delusional state about it yeah that yeah. works for me yeah that's a good framing that's a really good framing yeah yeah, yeah I was just thinking I find it really hard to get this one out of my head, this verse, this verse four somehow. But I was just thinking, I think I have to, I have to get um, the self-cherishing part first <laughs> before I can actually even think about this one. Yeah. Um, because if you, I'm a big self-cherisher, I have to say. So before I can even think about that, I've just got to work on the self-cherishing and then... I can move on to, to this one. Just, just, just saying, because yeah, it's really yeah. hard. I find it really, really hard to get my head around. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is helping you get rid of self-cherishing, but it's like, you know, expert level, <laughs> right? So it's like, start with the first one. Just stay there <laughs> as long as you need and realize it's in your own self-interest to cherish others. It's in their interest to cherish others. It's better for society, for the world, for all sentient beings to cherish others. Live in that place with the advantages. And, you know, you can start to look at also the disadvantages of when you don't and how that harms you, your relationships, society, et cetera. And just kind of live there, just trying to catch the sucker when it arises, just catch that little bugger. But the advanced training is to really see how deep you can go with framing problems in a radical way. And it still is seeing the way doing so helps you. It's in your own best interest to upgrade into this level. It's just, you don't wanna force it and you don't wanna rush it, you know, just really gently, yeah. So those are the ones we're doing today. And uh, we'll um, just take a minute and dedicate and we'll do the last four um, next week, same that time, same that place. So um, if you, uh, it'll be the same Zoom link, but make sure that you're booked in with Kunsang Yeshi and uh, huge thanks to Kunsang Yeshi for hosting this class. And it's so nice to see you guys again and to see non Kunsang Yeshi members as well. <laughs> so we'll just take a minute and dedicate. All of the energy we put into these thoughts, may we transform suffering into happiness, into bodhicitta. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life 
and may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Okay, so thanks everyone. And uh, there's um, some extra resources in the chat if you wanted any follow-up. Um, so there's a commentary from Lama Zopa Rinpoche that's um, available free online and I'll pop that in the chat once again, in case it got lost in the shuffle. <laughs> and uh, let's see the eight verses themselves. And um, there's actually a really good one from His Holiness. Um, which is just on his website as well. So I'll pop that in the chat as well. And um, basically, if you can't do copy and paste from the chat, you have to just click the link and it'll open up in your browser and then you can copy it from there. So those are those ones. And um, thanks again, everybody. And I'll leave the um, Zoom open for a second if you wanna wave to each other. So thanks, anyway. thanks guys. Thank you, Venerable Yonten. Just want to say thank you before you disappeared and you disappeared. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. See you again next week. Good night. Thanks.